Welcome to the FitFall Podcast, where you're going to hear about anything and everything sports tech related, whether that's sports watches, bike computers, bike trainers, trainer apps, and basically anything that you can use to level up your health, fitness, and sports game. So the two of us here is Dez of DezFit on YouTube uh, and myself, Ray of DC Rainmaker on both YouTube as well as DCRainmaker.com, both focused on sports technology, including all the things that Dez just mentioned, as well as drones, action cameras, and plenty more. So on today's episode of the FitVault Podcast, we're going to talk about Garmin's new quote-unquote entry-level Garmin Forner 165. What's the future of MIP and transflective displays? And then a listener also submitted a question about the end of life for security updates for Garmin watches. And then we also are going to talk about new power meters from Four Eyes as well as Favero. So let's see here. Once again, I'm going to go and leave it up to you. What's uh, What do you want to talk about first today? Um... Uh, let's let's mix it up. We we could do watches like you just said, but I think we go pedals. I think we just go straight into power meters, just to just to lose half the audience in one shot. And as a reminder, uh, for those of you on uh, YouTube, I think we can do this on Spotify as well. It's on Spotify we'll actually, as well. Yeah. We, yeah, we'll have chapter markers or basically timestamps where you can find uh, the markers to different sections of the video or the podcast, so you can just listen to whatever section that you want to. Anyways. With that, let's go ahead and start again. We're going to go and talk about power meter cranks as well as power meter pedals. Yep. So we got two new products uh, in the power meter sphere over the last week. Um, there is Four Eyes with their crank based power meter. Uh, that is their Four Eyes Precision 3 Plus Pro. Did I get it right? You got it. Yep. Oh, yes. First time. Boom. Yeah. So it's not, um, no, it's not the Precision 3 Plus, not the Precision 3, nor the Precision Pro, but the Precision 3 Plus Pro. Yeah, I, I mean, it, yeah, it's, that that took me a while to to decipher there. It's a it's a lot, um, and it's changed many many times over the years. So it's it's like been really tough to get it right the first time. Uh, essentially, what this is though is their dual sided version of their Precision Three um, series with the plus now added. And the way you can tell is that to try and deconstruct this entire name here for you, Precision is the brand name Four Eyes, and that's spelled four with then four eyes. Uh, it came from like a decade ago when they made a heads up display way before the Apple Vision. Pl- Plus Pro days, way before the uh, Google <laughs> Google Glass days, they had a little heads up display that like showed you your running and slugging metrics on it, um, and that was four eyes because you had extra. Uh, anyways, um, so that that name stuck. Precision though does not have any extra eyes in it, thankfully this time around. Uh, and then you have three, the Gen three uh, Plus indicates the most recent version of that generation, and then Pro indicates that it's a dual sided power meter uh, as opposed to a single sided power meter on one side. So the uh, the evolution of this one basically is they came out with their Precision 3 Plus power meter, which was just a left side crank arm. And then this is the dual sided version. And so this one's going to be for uh, current generation Shimano and Ultegra yep. crank, cranks. Is that correct? correct. Dura and Ultegra, right. yep. Um, so right. uh, it's notable because up until now, um, there really has not been many options in the Shimano, Durace, and Ultegra realm for the current generation cranks anyways that actually work. You have Shimano's own <laughs> offering, which is, of course, dumpster fire status, um, you know, the worst power meter out there. Uh, and then you've got Stages, which is a very accurate, great option. There's Stages LR for uh, current generation uh, Ultegra and Dura-Ace. I've tested out. Uh, GP Lama, Shane Miller has tested out. Both of us are pretty happy with that. Um, the downside, though, is that Stages as a company is it's been a bit rough lately. And so uh, they haven't answered the phone on support and things like that. And so it's tough to recommend a product when consumers literally for the last six, eight months can't get anyone to answer a phone call. Um, so that brings us back to Four Eyes, which, you know, from a, a testing standpoint, just to kind of jump right into it, uh, accuracy, it looks like it's spot on to me. I spent a lot of time uh, both on road, where it's mostly focused on, given this is the road group set side of things, uh, as well as gravel and getting lost on places that I thought were road that were very much not road. Uh, and throughout all that, uh, no problem. Same goes for um, cobblestones and uh, other sort of bricks sort of things that, you know, cause vibrations and whatnot. And it's been good. So this is fascinating to me that Shimano themselves, who created their own crank and their own power meter, they can't necessarily get it right, but an aftermarket company can bolt something on to a Shimano crank and get accurate results. So what do you think is the issue there with the Shimano side of things and how can Four Eyes pull this off? I think it's two things. In the case of Four Eyes, um, they're wholly focused as a company on this and they've got the right engineers to do that. I think they also don't care about, in some ways, 
what it looks like at the end of the day. And don't get me wrong, the, the four eye solution looks beautiful. Like it's really nice. But I, I keep getting the feeling that uh, Shimano wants something that's easy to manufacture uh, and doesn't you know impact their manufacturing of the base crank set itself, and also is aesthetically as clean and as perfect as you can from a Shimano standpoint. And I think those two components, especially the manufacturing side of it, um, are pieces that are just really challenging for them to to nail down without compromising something else in their manufacturing realm. And uh, how does this compare price-wise to Shimano and Stages? Is this about the same? It's in the same ballpark as Stages, so pretty much there. Okay. Uh, and it's pretty much in the same ballpark as a you know built-in Shimano power meter. Um, and so you basically can buy it in one or two versions. One, you can buy it uh, where they uh, you send in your existing Shimano crank set to them, and then they basically just you know add this onto it um, and then send it back to you. Uh, or you can buy it uh, where they send you into the entire crank set. So you're basically rebuying the entire crank set. So that's mm. that's mostly if you were to you know build your own bike or things like that that you would want to just buy the whole thing and just install it as done or if you just didn't want to deal with sending your old crank set back now i think uh this crank set actually has two kind of unique features to it so the first one is that it actually has apple find my support um yep. so <laughs> tell us about that so it's basically like an air tag for your bike right it's exactly it. it's an air tag built into your bike um i think technically speaking you actually get two of them i only paired up one of them like i didn't bother doing it to both sides but i think technically speaking you can air tag both sides of the crank set and in my case i just did the left side because that was the easiest to get the battery cap off of and maybe you can't do the right side because has screws on there and it just was too much work but in any case you basically just add it to your apple find my device list just like an air tag um but a third party air tag so apple does have both their native air tags which is a little you know coin sized things that you're familiar with and then they have third-party ability to add into the find my network and we've seen other companies do this so the very one of the very first four companies to adopt apple's third-party network was uh, van moof which is a a dutch-based company of basically smart fancy bikes they've since gone out of business but uh you do have find my there and what's actually notable about this in this particular example them going out of business is that it doesn't matter Um, because once that pairing occurs between apple and that bike then the bike manufacturer side of it is completely taken out of it in the case of van moof they had their own tracking system that was in place there that tracking system is now dead because the company is basically dead Um, but the apple portion still continues to work because that's leveraging the apple side of it Gotcha. And uh, I think another neat feature about it, so you can obviously use the Find My support for situations like a stolen bike, but you could also use it to actually track your activity so friends and family could follow along. Yeah, totally, because you can share AirTags um, as well as AirTag items as of last summer. Uh, One of the big requests that's been along for a long time. So I can share my bike to you. Like Shane, for example, his 4 ice unit, he shared it to me, and I can see where Shane and his bike is at any point in time. Um, And certainly for most people, they're going to have their phone with them. Um, So this is just one extra thing in case you forget your phone or your phone battery dies. Uh, The AirTag equivalency here will still transmit to other uh, basically iPhone and other Apple device users nearby. So if you're riding a group of people and your phone dies, uh, then it's going to continue to show your location because uh, it'll have that that basically air tag equivalency on your bike built in. Oh, gotcha. Very cool. Um, so the other kind of more unique feature or selling point would be that they have a terrain selector feature. So this is what for like cobblestones and like yeah so this is like this is a, a tech company <laughs> getting a bit smart at branding what is just an algorithm into a, a okay. marketing feature so they're calling it the okay. automatic terrain selector um and the long and the short of that it basically when you hit rougher terrain and detects that it ramps up the gyro as opposed to just the accelerometer so adds okay. the gyro in there as well that of course does reduce some of your battery life uh so the idea there is that that's how they get that much longer battery life but they turn that off if you're on normal smooth roads or even slightly bumpy roads they don't need the gyro for that that's just overkill but when you gotcha. go on to you know really nasty cobblestones or really rough mountain biking type scenarios etc uh this will kick in and then it gives your better or more accuracy uh for that that those power values so is the the gyroscope is that something that other manufacturers are utilizing like all the time then it's just that four eyes is turning it off just to get their i mean their yep. pretty insane battery life claims that they have on in, there. A, in a nutshell yeah that's basically what others are doing and different companies do different levels of using the gyro um and but we generally don't see coin cell battery uh options at this high you know in battery that claims 500 hours that they're claiming right now um, mm-hmm. and it's good to see them find some middle ground uh, i think you myself and you know shane had tested earlier versions of this about a year ago and mm-hmm. uh, you know we saw that they were trying to hit these really 
crazy high battery numbers of like 800 hours. Uh, but in doing so, they were cutting back on lots of other things. And that would lead to dropouts, for example, uh, for the communication stack, because they try to tune that, uh, that transmission power as low as possible. When you do that, then you start having connectivity issues and so on. So I have had zero connectivity issues with this unit uh, whatsoever. And I've tried a whole bunch of different watches and bike computers, uh, Apple Watch, Garmin watches, uh, bike computers from Wahoo, as well as Garmin, and, and no problems here at all. That was uh, certainly an issue I saw with uh, previous Borai's products was uh, connectivity issues for sure. So glad to hear that they're uh, doing well with this new one. Um, so I guess talking about terrain, let's move on to the new Fibero. Hey, can you get it all in one shot, the name? This is another name test. This is like a, an episode of name testing. Oh, well, I'm cheating because I have it right in front of my screen here. So Fibero Asioma MX mountain bike pedals right or is there more there's more to Asiomo it pro mx-2 oh, i missed the pedals. pro darn it yeah <laughs> and the dash oh, it's the MX2. because it's dual and, ah okay wow all right so yeah we have had this like little trend this year on um very complicated names anyways the new yeah. uh vero Asiomo pro mx-2 SPD power meter pedals. And what's exciting about these is that it's a kind of a short list of power meter SPD pedals that's on the marketplace right now. And yep. um, another exciting thing too, is that, you know, Fibero has been known for some very accurate and quote unquote, quite affordable power meter pedals over the years. So with these, they removed the pod and uh, they went with basically a different measurement system. And again, the other exciting thing is that it's a SPD off-road compatible pedal. So um, yeah, you yeah. got them right in front of you. So go ahead and yeah, so exactly. Lead us so away for those, with these. those on YouTube, you get extra credit here, or extra yeah. uh, extra bonus content. Um, but got the two side by side, and you can see in the case of the Fivero pedal, uh, sorry, the uh, mountain bike pedal, the SPD pedal, it no longer has that pod at all. So that pod used to have house the battery as well as some of the communication components, uh, and that's now gone. Uh, and it's fully within the spindle, about half of the spindle, and the spindle is basically the long piece that goes uh, all the way down from your crank arm to the other end. And about half of the spindle on the new uh, mountain bike pedal is essentially just the battery itself. Yet despite this uh, you know, rearranging of things and making it smaller, the battery is actually increased from a claimed uh, 60, or sorry, from a claimed 50 hours on the road pedal to 60 hours on the mountain bike pedal. But as you mentioned, the big ticket item is, is frankly just the price. Um, so the price is 614 euros plus VAT. So it ends up being like 730 to 740 for the dual sided ones, um, which is essentially half the price of Garmin's Rally XC200s. Uh, and these are lighter. They're 191 grams a shot um, versus Garmin's. Uh, Garmin has a win when it comes to the battery life is longer from theirs. Um, but you can also swap out the pedal bodies of these for 49 bucks. So if you kill one of these pedal bodies, it's only 49 bucks to replace it 49 versus 200. Bucks. That's yep. cheap. Wow. Versus 200 wow. for Garmin's. Um, now, if you kill the spindle, that's a different story. But frankly, if, like, if you kill the spindle, then something's gone wrong. And they've got a multi-year warranty. They say they're basically going to warranty anything. Like if you manage to break the spindle, it sounds like it's one of those good on you. You can have a new spindle for free sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But 49 bucks is just astounding and being it's much much smaller so if i were to grab like garmin's pedal here and you can see these side by side i mean just how to find a place that's not blocked by the mic stand but um it's just <laughs> basically it's a much much smaller pedal um and it's all metal as well so garmin uses a uh plastic's probably the, a bit of a not a, not necessarily a fair way to say it but they use a polymer um for the inside portion of the, the pedal body um and they use metal on the outside favero is using metal all the way around one of the things i said in my review though is practically speaking again sort of like the spindle if you were to crack the polymer on garmin's case like the interior portion that's that's plastic there then something likely very horrific has happened um to you and your your bike um so that's probably the least of your concerns uh but nonetheless if you did in garmin's case it's 200 bucks to replace that and Favero's again, it's 49 bucks. Overall, I'm really happy. From an accuracy standpoint, the thing that matters has been spot on. I've taken it uh, mountain biking, gravel biking, road biking, into the ocean, um, like all the things, and it's still a happy little camper. Um, now, does it have all the pedaling dynamics and whatnot that come on their uh, Favero, their Asiomo Duos? 
It actually has more. So one of the things that was missing um, from their road-based pedals was platform center offset, um, basically showing kind of where you are on the spindle left and right. Uh, that's been added to the new pedals. So from a cycling dynamics standpoint, they are identical to Garmin's uh, cycling dynamics now. Uh, and Garmin opened up cycling dynamics back many years ago. Um, and Favera was really the only company to take advantage of that uh, and to leverage that uh, from a power meter standpoint. And so you can use these pedals or Garmin's and they'll basically go ahead and transmit the exact same information between the two of them. Now, uh, I think what's kind of funny about these Favero pedals is that they were announced a long time ago, but it's just like been kind of spotty availability, right? Like you could get them in Italy, but yep. as of the filming of this podcast, they're available world, worldwide? Exactly. So uh, the idea was that initially they wanted to launch in the Italian market only. Um, and so you could place a pre-order back in December on these. Maybe it was even like late November or something like that. They put yeah. a site up there. Um, but they would only ship if you were in Italy and they wanted to use that as a beta. Uh, now they're going to start shipping globally. So now you can order them anywhere uh, and go from there. Uh, a lot of comparable features for sure. And again, like you're get, you are getting a metal pedal body. Now, um, and, and like Ray said, like I've, I've been a mountain biker since, uh, I was like 15 years old and I've never broken. And I mean, for, well, okay. I have broken one. It was, it was just like a resin pedal, I guess you could say on like a dirt jump bike at one point. And like Ray said, you'd have to be, you know, in a pretty precarious position for that to happen. And I ended up in a pretty precarious position. So it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think people aren't really understanding the extent of, um, your mountain biking experience level though here um like i feel like we need to play right now uh, for those that are on the video side um as an encouragement to go see the video side the one clip where i had you test some gopro stuff in switzerland going down oh. that crazy <laughs> rock thing with jig like just full yeah. send you had never seen this in your life before you had no idea what was going to be down this entire shoot and you just sent it and hope for the best and yeah. uh mm -hmm. I, yeah so I mean, I yeah. gave you my emergency contact information, so it was all fine. <laughs> I think you were air tagged. I could find your body eventually. Um, yeah, exactly. but yeah, no, this is, you know, the, the main thing for me is that like, if I'm going to go out and buy, like if I convince, uh, Bobby, my wife to get a mountain bike, to buy a mountain bike, then I will unquestionably put a pair of these on there. Like why mm -hmm. would I at this point spend twice as much, um, for the rally pedals, uh, mm -hmm. uh in most cases. I mean, the, yeah, the battery life is, is better there, but it's rechargeable. It's quick and easy to deal with. Like it's, it's not a problem. Now, one thing I would, uh, before we move on to the, the Garmin forerunner, I think one interesting topic that we could talk about here too, is that, you know, we have the option of like a crank based power meter with the four eyes versus pedal based. And so why would, why would one buy a crank based in the whole scheme of things? I think the main reason to buy crank-based if it's already on your bike. Um, so if you're going out and buying a bike um, and that bike has an option to upgrade to a power meter variant, as many bikes do these days when you buy them, and it's just, you know, a couple hundred bucks or something like that, honestly, just, just do that. Your life is probably going to be, be simpler. Um, mm -hmm. And most of the power meters are offered built into bikes these days with the exception of Shimano's um, tend to be pretty accurate. So you'll find, for example, four eyes uh, as part of this whole thing, they're also announcing continued partnership with specialized and their power meters are equipped on many different specialized bikes, including ones that have historically been on the uh, world tour. So the tour de France, et cetera, uh, the teams there. And so in those cases, you're having trusted brands like four eyes and stages and others out there, rotor, et cetera, um, that those units are just built in. Um, if however mm -hmm. you've got an existing bike, then it can be often really difficult to find a compatible power meter for that crank set. There's, it gets really complex really quick. And so pedals are very appealing in that you just buy and slap it on and you're done. Like it's a, oh. it's the literal easy button, um, especially for mountain bikes versus, uh, on the road bike side, uh, tends to be a little bit easier because most people tend to frankly end up on either Shimano cranks or SRAM cranks and you can, the compatibility matrix are a lot simpler. Yeah, I mean, the honestly, the only reason I have any crank-based power meters is strictly for comparison against pedals outside. Uh, when I'm inside, I have an indoor trainer to compare the pedals or cranks to. But for my use cases, I uh, like for me, I absolutely love the Garmin Rally XC pedals because I can switch them between my gar uh, gravel bike and my mountain bike. And I think, you know, what, what I like about pedals as well is that when I go travel, like if I go see you or something like that and you have a bike for me, 
all I need to do is bring a pair of pedals um, and exactly. I'm good to go with power. So um, so I think the Favero option, that's going to be interesting to see how those pan out overall. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's great to see and it's great to see that price be a lot more affordable now. Um, like you, when I travel, um, like we went, we've gone on many, many trips together and to places we rented mountain bikes and stuff and just be able to yeah. throw those pedals in versus an entire bike is is so much easier. Yep, yep. And uh, now with the Viveros, uh, you have some extra money for some uh, good dinners <laughs> out there, That <laughs> <too>. is true. <laughs> that is true. All right, so let's move on to Garmin's latest Forerunner watch. So this is the Forerunner 165. So this is, like I said at the beginning of the episode, their new quote-unquote entry-level Forerunner, but I wouldn't think of this as an upgraded Garmin Forerunner 55. I would call this more of a trimmed down foreigner to 65 would you agree yeah it's been it's it's tricky so like it, it's it's really tough because like on one hand i want to compare it to a foreigner 55 which is the the budget one that costs like 170 to 200 bucks depending on on the pricing and stuff like that um versus the foreigner 265 so this sits in the middle this is 249 299 correct Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And it's an AMOLED display, so it takes the 265, the AMOLED display, and essentially it cuts some features out of it. So you remove things like training readiness, for example, and you don't have multi-sport triathlon mode um, nor power meter support. Um, but it has all the running stuff that you need. So it includes running power and running efficiency metrics and structure workouts and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting little watch. Like it's it's the watch where if you wanted just a little bit more than the 455 this this gets you there um i actually asked garmin i said is this is this a successor to the 455 or is it different right and obviously i was aware that it has the one in front of it as opposed to not a yeah, one um exactly and they came back with a very like well it has a one in front of it therefore it's the next level up and it's like okay kind of but then what happens to 455 so we have no idea by the way if there's going to be a foreigner 65 like that's that's not part of yeah. this this is like truly strictly the foreigner 165 and i think that was maybe our expectation when we first got the news of it was and maybe our minds we were thinking okay so it's a successor to the 55 but you know then i saw the price i was like oh 249 299 i'm like oh that's that's a bit more than the 55 and that that starts to stretch the budget level i would compare it more again to like a trim down 265 versus a 55 successor so for the money again like when i looked at the price i was like eh seems a little bit much but when you start to look at the features there's a lot there for the money i mean it no it doesn't have the power meter support um yep. so what it's i would basically say is that, definitely yeah, and that's exactly it. It's like this is a very value packed running and fitness watch with Definitely. a lot of health features, too. Yeah. I think the thing, too, to keep in mind is that, you know, Garmin, like most companies, is trying to increase the price points of the things that you buy, right? It's, just, it's yeah. frankly uh-huh. as simple as that. And so, um, you know, there has not been a 1X uh, Forerunner series watch since the Forerunner 110, which was like a decade ago or something like that. Um, and so we haven't seen like a 120, 130, 140, et cetera. We just saw the 110 and that was that was it there. And we've jumped up to the 200s instead. Um, and so from a price standpoint, this lets them sell a slightly more expensive watch where some of that may have been going, I can get a 455 or I can get an Apple Watch SE, but I like the Apple Watch SE display. I like some of the more connected features. Maybe I'll, oh, 400, 165 at basically the same price point. Well, that's appealing, right? And then now Garmin is making 250 as opposed to 160 and change, depending on you know the pricing and stuff like that. Then you take that into the holiday season and imagine Garmin will drop the price of this on sale to be probably 199, 249, right? That the fifty dollar mm-hmm. uh, drop there, and now it gets it into roughly the same ballpark as a four runner fifty five was during the holidays, anyway. So. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's I'd say business savvy of them, and I don't see much obvious downside when looking at it purely from a forerunner angle. Yeah, no, I mean I I think we <laughs> I think with every Garmin release, we we tend to expect a little bit of a price bump with every single yep. one, and you know, so as much as I was initially bummed about the price bump uh, after I started looking at features, I'm like, hey, this is not bad. But again, it was kind of something we were expecting, so. I guess the other topic with this watch, though, is that it's going AMOLED. And at this point, seeing that the 
Vivo Active series with the Vivo Active 5 went to AMOLED. I yep. mean, that was the Vivo Active was the memory and pixel or transflective uh, smartwatch from yeah. Garmin. And, you know, they, they essentially just changed that around and went to AMOLED. So with this 165, though, does this mean the end of MIP or transflective displays for foreigners? So I think we have two answers there. I think we have the answer they're willing to give. And I think we have the <laughs> answer that's reality, right? So yeah. the answer they're willing to give, I asked this. Uh, yeah, and I, yeah said, I did too. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And so here is the exact quote uh, from Garmin um, on whether or not this is the this marks the end of MIP-based 4Runner displays. We're still going to have instincts and maybe we'll still have another Phoenix, yeah, yeah. probably still another Phoenix um, yep. for at least one more generation. But uh, I don't... Uh, you know, I don't see any changes on instinct side, but from a forerunner standpoint, you know, we've seen the 955 go 965 for AMOLED, the two series go 265 for AMOLED. And now we have this in the middle. Um, and they said, anyways, we have seen great success on a forerunner 265 and 965. And so we wanted to bring AMOLED to our entire forerunner lineup and be able to offer it at a more budget friendly price point. We expect to see continued success with AMOLED displays, but we always want to keep our options open as well. Smiley face. So, <laughs> uh, I think practically speaking, I can't see a scenario where they come out with a mid based forerunner, even if it's a forerunner sixty five. Like, yeah, I think I agree. consumers I at agree. this point, largely due to Fitbit, honestly, at that price point, if not a Maze Fit and other companies at sub two hundred dollar watches, like you think about the the Versa series for Fitbit, for example, they that's what people expect now. They expect a pretty vibrant display um, and. I don't see that that happening at a mid based display. Well, and I think at this point too, the battery savings or the battery efficiency they've gotten out of AMOLED displays, at this point, it's not just usable, but it's very, very good. So uh -huh. the benefits of MIP at this point, one being that it's very readable in bright sunlight and the battery life. Well, the AMOLED displays at this point, gosh, I mean, I have literally zero complaints outside i mean i yeah. there's 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 not one point where i'm like oh boy i can't see this thing at all like it's it's incredible i mean i, I think in some situations like even we were uh hiking around in tenerife uh last year and um i had an mip and a amoled watch and i was you know comparing the two well it was kind of like half cloudy half sunny conditions and throughout the day like I preferred the AMOLED just because it was just yeah. easier in all sorts of conditions, like all the conditions versus just bright sunlight. And again, like now that with the 165, so I basically have turned on like all the settings like all day long and I'm getting like four days out of it, which is still yep. very, very good for turning everything on. Like, I mean, you know, blood oxygen, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and then I think you can get up to 11 days out of it. And at this point, that's still far exceeding what you can get out of far exceeding what you can get out of like an Apple Watch SE. So yeah, I'm in the exact yeah. same boat. So I'm I'm getting four days with always on and everything else turned on. Um, yeah. GPS is highest, including roughly an hour to two hours, depending on the day of GPS um, outside activity. So today I had just shy two hours of GPS activities outside. The day before was two hours and so on. And so um, I'm getting four days solid and always on configuration. And I'm trending when I go back to regular mode. Um, so gesture base where you raise your wrist up and it turns on, then I'm getting that closer to that 11 days or so um, without any problem. But from a brightness and brilliance standpoint outside, zero problems in bright sun or darkness or at night, it's never too bright because you have sleep mode now. I think, again, we've talked about this in other areas, but if you're thinking of AMOLED displays and LC displays from even just two and a half years ago, three years ago, those are very different displays than the displays of the last year to year and a half. Like that's entirely different ballpark where those displays, yeah, two, three years ago were sometimes actually really difficult to see um, in bright sunlight. But now it's just, I don't think it's an issue anymore. I, I really don't. I think there's, there are holdouts out there. And to be honest with you, I was one of those holdouts as well when the Epics first came out, the Epics Gen 2. It was hard for me to transition to that. Not necessarily because of like readability outside or anything like that. It was almost like I felt like I was cheating, <laughs> you know, a bit <laughs> where, you know, it's like, you know, at that point, 
three, two and a half, three years ago, um, AMOLED displays were reserved for smartwatches, not sports watches. And, you yep. know, at that point, you know, you're talking Garmin Phoenixes, Garmin Forerunners, uh, the Garmin Enduros, you know, all those watches with very, very good battery life having these MIP displays. And again, it's just kind of something that was more for that outdoor sports focused industry. And we've seen things transition fast, I think. And um, yep. I think the, the, the holdouts for MIP, I think... It, you should definitely like try to live with one, like truly live with one yeah. and, and see, see how it goes. And, you know, I think that there is still going to be a place for MIP just because you simply can't get like the, you know, 20 to 30 day battery life sort of thing out of, uh, yeah. out of an AMOLED display watch at this point, at least, you know, at least if you have, you know, always on display yeah. on, like, you know, I'm, I'm actually trying to wrap up the, uh, soon to a vertical review right here. And, you know, this thing, this thing is bonkers. Like it's like 30 days easily uh, yep. for the battery life and it's super, super present. So I still think there is a place for MIP moving forward again for the, for the audience that wants that super extended long, never have to worry about it. Battery yeah, life. The instinct of the world, right? The, the literal forever battery that instinct has with solar and stuff like that, right? Where you can theoretically mm -hmm never charge it um in the right sun conditions yeah. and stuff like that so that's that's at this point in time technology wise isn't yet happening on amoled will it happen in the future of course probably eventually it will right it's just not not there today yeah and and that's i think the the other point about the solar charging too is that you know solar uh definitely has its benefits with the lcd type displays on the instinct as well as memory and pixel displays just because of the battery consumption but you know solar with amoled that technology is like not even close to here yet <laughs> on those yep. sort of displays so um but yeah i think it's going to be i think the most interesting thing to look at is probably going to be garmin's phoenix series moving forward i guess number one if they're going to be actually extending their enduro C series anymore just because the phoenix 7x is already getting you know such good battery life yep. at, at this point um but the the phoenix lineup is probably going to be the most interesting to see where they go from here because they i think so they've it's... certainly gone all in with epics indeed we talked about this a little bit in the, the sports watch year in review but like it's funny because from a branding standpoint, you're at a conflict of two potentially really good brands. Like if you wanted to think about battery life forever, right? You would call it the Enduro because the name like straight up implies that. And you would say, hey, our MIP-based one going forward will be the Enduro, battery life forever, and we have epics for everything else. Except the Phoenix brand is so strong, right? And it's, I mean, it's yeah. a massive, massive business for Garmin, uh, well beyond just sports people like you and I, right? It's people, everyday people that just want a long lasting battery watch um, are buying that, that may not ever like run a hundred meters um, are, are buying that watch. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've told the story in the past, like one of the teams I was working on um, when I worked for Microsoft now, like I guess eight years ago, um, a bunch of guys that we all traveled the world two, 300,000 miles a year, um, that was the norm for our team. We're on an airplane every single week. And some of the guys uh, worked out a lot and some of the guys uh, not not so much. Um, and there was a lot of those guys, nonetheless, that wanted a Phoenix watch because the battery life lasted forever, right? And they didn't care about the sports feature at all. They just wanted a smartish kind of watch on their wrist and that checked that box. And they had no interest in the sporting side of it. And so that's where, from a brand standpoint, people look for the Phoenix watch. Now, if they can't find that brand or that brand looks old, they're going to be like, oh, I'll move on to, to something else. Now, something else may not be knowing there's an Enduro watch, which again, like I did an entire post on this where people don't realize that Epix is literally just the AMLA display Phoenix, just by a different name, exact same watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I mentioned this in my sports watch or the sports watch year interview video yeah. as well as that, you know, I did a Epix versus phoenix video and you know thinking that oh you know this this will get a couple of views it's pretty astounding how many views it, it's gotten but like i mentioned in that video is that there are practical differences to how the display works in day-to-day -day life as well as outdoors but i think that garmin is um they're in a naming pickle for what they're probably the next like couple of years i would say in that yep. upper threshold of their premium sports tools or sports watches so since we're talking about pickles, we have to pickles. talk about the big pickle here. The big pickle is why on earth is there a Vivo Active 5 and a 4Runner 165? Yeah. I mean, I 
I, well, and, you know, we could even bring up the fact that it's a Vivo Active 5, which is a mini venue three. Uh, but even, but get this though. So like I was doing a bunch of photos the other night um, for the review back and forth. And mm -hmm. I had used my, like when I write reviews, I basically pull up the review for the previous most nearest gen watch to that, right? So I pull that up and I start, I just have it off the side in a different tab and I go side by side and I basically walk through so I don't forget all these things. So I'm writing from scratch every time, but I'm using that as my like reminder template of sorts. And I'm looking at photos in that review. And so I happen to pull up the Vivo Active 5 because that was like the nearest thing I could think of that was mm -hmm. recent. So totally. it included things like the new nap features and sleep features and that kind of stuff, right? And so as I'm going through this, you know, I'm like finding all the same things and putting them in there, et cetera. Um, and then I get down to the battery manager power save feature, right? And they are identical features on the Vivo Active 5 and the 465, except the titling is different at the top as to which one they use, right? So one of them calls it battery, they're too far over there, but one of them calls it battery manager, one of them calls it power manager. And you're like, why? Why does that exist? <laughs> Why is there a difference there between, and I've done an entire video on like stupid differences on some of these watches and to Garmin's credit, they even have kind of commented back somewhat privately saying like, we agree, this is, this is a problem. But to that extent, like, why is there still a difference? Why, what does, I mean, and I, I understand from like a sports feature standpoint, little things that are different between these two watches, but I don't know why this, I just don't, I don't get it. I don't, it's I think, I mean, so much overlap. It's, you know, there is, but at the same time, I could see there being uh, an audience out there that may be almost intimidated by buying a Garmin for a runner as a sports yep. watch. Going back to the whole like Phoenix thing, uh, you yeah. know, for some people that maybe didn't work out that, you know, some people may be intimidated by, you know, it's like, well, I don't, you know, I can't really get a forerunner because, uh, you know, I'm not a real athlete or something like that. And, you know, everyone's an athlete. It's just, yeah. you know, what kind of level athlete you are. Um, so uh, maybe it's just kind of a branding thing to tailor, to basically kind of tailor to a specific audience. Maybe. It's I, definitely I, a branding thing for certain. I guess my problem is it's really hard to prove a negative here, right? Meaning that a lot of people have said Garmin has so many flipping models now. It is impossible to decide. And there is a segment of the population that goes, whatever, I'm just buying an Apple Watch, right? Like you have three options, SE, current gen, whatever, nine, et cetera, or ultra, done, right? Like it's it's very, very straightforward in the grand scheme of things. You can choose different sizes and all that kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, you have three options and that's it. Um, and uh, with very clear, very different price points, right? Um, if you want to spend 200, 250 bucks, it's an SE. If you want to spend 400 bucks, it's the current gen. And if you want to spend a lot more, it is the ultra. Like, again, very, very simple. Now you look at this and go, okay, I have 300 bucks plus or minus 50 bucks to spend on a Garmin watch. Do we want to dare to name all the options that you have at that price point from a Garmin watch? <laughs> right? Yeah. So you've got yeah. Vivo Active 5, 400, yeah. 265. 400, mm -hmm. 165, uh, you've got Instinct 2, um, because that sits in that price ball, ballpark there. Uh -huh. uh, you've got umpteen different Garmin watches that aren't officially old, but are still there that are available, right? Yeah. That you can buy uh -huh. because they're on the list. Um, okay. You've got Venue 3 when it's on sale half the time. You got like, Venue SQ2 at, you know, that, at full price. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. I mean, like, and I'm sure we're missing others. And that, like God help us if we talk about all the golf watches that also like blah into there too, or different other options that are on that market. Like I'm just in, in you and I can explain these. Like I can, you and I can sit down and like play like Uno style, name off every single difference of these things. But can a Best Buy employee do that? Or like a, uh, you know, like that's very, very difficult to do. And I just, again, the Best Buy employee is going to be like, over here and I, and I get Garmin's counter argument is that look at their investor or investment or not investor look at their their stock uh, price look at their you know mm -hmm. earnings and all that's doing great but I always come back to would it do better if it was simpler like if if they just simplified would it do better yeah uh I mean it's it's funny from a content creator standpoint it um we never <laughs> We never we never have uh, we never have a shortage of Garmin comparison videos that we could do like no. never 
Like, yeah. It's, I mean, and that's that's what's funny about this 160 Bob. I'm like, which comparison video should I do first? Because I've got so many options. It's crazy. Like I could. <laughs> I've got four watches over there charging. I'm like, it could be against the Venue 5. It could be, so be back to 5. It could be against the Venue 3. It could be against the 265. Maybe I should do a flyer and be like 55 for fun, right? Like just, just pull it out. And yeah, and I, don't get me wrong. Like I, I appreciate the ability to have lots of fun with all these watches. Um, I just wonder, I, I, every time we see new watches that don't have like a clear swim lane, you sit there and wonder like, where does this, this fit in? And again, I don't, obviously Garmin, Garmin believes financially it works out for them. Um, and that, that makes sense to them. Um, and, you know, from a product standpoint, they're making good products. Like, I don't think any of us are questioning that these are good products or that they're overpriced or anything like that. I think it's just a question of, like, is it too complicated for the the mainstream person to to understand? Um, but it also gets to, like, a lot of people, uh, you know, comment I often hear is, uh, you know, you release so many Garmin reviews, but you've only done, like, a couple reviews for Sunto or Polar in, in X time period per year. <laughs> oh, look at the number of watches that are available. Like, that's it's basically simple. It. Like, it's a very simple math <laughs> equation. Like, exactly. on an average year for our segment, Garmin releases between 22 and 27 products, right? Like, on an average year for trainers and bike computers and watches and power meters and you fill in all the like radar, et cetera, right? I count it up each year and it's usually between 22 and 27 products, you know, like the Lily. Oh, by the way, another watch to add to that list right there. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Lily. Yep. And what's, what's the other one? The, um, uh, the not Lily, the other stylish looking one. Um, oh, the Vivo move or there Vivo. We go. Yeah. Move, Vivo move trend. Yeah. Yep. That's another See, one. Another one. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't want to talk about things like the crossover and so on. Uh, anyways, <laughs> like it versus a Polar or a Sundo will release one to two watches per year, right? And Apple is going to release, you know, two to three watches per year, depending on what's going on. Um, like it's a very simple numbers game at the end of the day. Yeah. So I guess this is one of those, unfortunately, consumers can have analysis paralysis with so many Garmin watches that are out there. I mean, that's that's truly, it's amazing like how many comments we get. Like, okay, so should I get a 265 or should I get a Venue 3? And, you know, what exactly is the difference between the two? But which, by the way, is some inside baseball there for people. Um, the comparison videos that Des and I do um, tend to be, at least for me and I think for you as well, like some of the most profitable videos on, on oh, yeah. YouTube anyways mm-hmm. at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, but secretly, they're the ones that we hate the most. Like oh, behind God. the scenes, we no. both despise creating them. Like I'm charging all those watches over there. What do you think is the likelihood, Des, that will actually create a comparison video? I I guess it depends on your time. I know you have a busy schedule over the next few days. And, um, you know, we also have spring ramping up too. So we'll have to see. I mean, I, what I would what I would say is that commit to one. And <laughs> I do like, need to commit to one. Yeah. To commit to it's, one. Yeah. The problem I think we both have is we go down these rabbit holes of all these oh, differences God. that you start yeah. going down like at a very high level. Like I, I could say 265 versus 165, top five differences, right? No training readiness, no um, multi sport kind of triathlon support, no power meters, um, no. I guess that's really the that's three a, biggies. That's, a, I think those are the three biggies. Yeah. Right. Oh, those are the three biggies. But, what happens between four and 10 is where things go really wrong for both of us quickly. Because we start exactly. like sitting there with the watches side by side and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. this and this and that and that. And before you know it, you spent six hours researching before you even start filming. And it's, yeah, it's just a complete rabbit hole of, of fun. The funniest comparison probably was, uh, I believe, your epics versus foreigner 965 <laughs> video. And this is one of those, like again, like in terms of like... Very profitable videos, but very frustrating videos to do too. Uh, when we were texting back and forth, when the 965 came out, he's like, uh, you know, Ray's like, oh, so yeah, I'm kind of going down this rabbit hole with Epix versus 965. I'm like, oh God, I started to go down that rabbit hole too. At that point, I actually just kind of like said, you know what? Go ahead and have this because I, <laughs> I, I, I was getting, I was getting frustrated up until that point because there are some crazy weird differences between those like i mean you know like both have touchscreen maps but they work just ever so slightly differently and and oh there's some there's some weird ones with that comparison yeah i don't believe i've done a comparison since i am so (laughs) scarred by that experience i believe that is the last one um it was i think the title of the video was 65 differences 65 Mm. differences between these two watches that 
frankly should not exist at that level. Like there should be some differences, like one is plastic, one is metal, right? But like one has a flashlight, one doesn't, but it should not be like little tiny differences that you just go, why? The UI design type stuff that just doesn't, doesn't make sense. And again, to Garmin's yeah. credit, after I published that video, a few people reasonably high up were like, yeah, there's, there's some stuff that, that should not fundamentally should not be different between these two watches. They, there are some things that are different. Like they're different. They have, they purposefully have a different UI design style between okay. Epics and Forerunner. And we won't talk about that today because that'll go down another rabbit hole. But um, assuming that that is okay, um, there is like wording differences that should not exist between those two. And just again, that power manager versus battery manager type of stuff or, uh-huh. or like ordering of things or that kind of stuff that you're like, just doesn't, there's no good reason for this kind of stuff from a code base standpoint, from a technology, from a development standpoint should exist. Uh, but again, to Garmin's credit, they have been consolidating those differences. Uh, we're seeing that uh, between Forerunner and Epix, especially over the last really year, I would say, um, uh-huh. where lots of little things that, many people will never notice techies notice and they're like why is this different um and now those are not different right so like mapping is a really good example there used to be a lot of weird quirks on the forerunner 955 and 965 when it came to maps and the display of maps and the display of trails and overlays and stuff like that that are now largely consolidated to be identical to what epics and phoenix are doing Yep. And I would also give them a lot of credit in terms of software releases now too, where yep. they're actually releasing to uh, lots of different watch models at one time, the same features. And that again, it just kind of, you know, eliminates the whole like, oh, well, is uh, the Epix Gen 2 got this? Is my X- Epix Pro going to get this? And, you know, yep. vice versa. So they, they've really been getting a lot better on the software release cycle as well. So, um, which kind of brings us into the last topic that we're going to talk about today. So a user, uh, Twitter user hit us up a question that was about Garmin's end of life security updates for their watches. So basically with this, um, this person mentioned, he, I think, I can't remember which watch it was, but basically, basically he like scrolled way, way, way down on the spec list and said that the software, uh, for the security updates was only going to last like three years or four years after launch or something like that. And yeah, that was an interesting one. I refrained from going down that rabbit hole, but I think you went down that rabbit hole a bit. So I, I dug down the rabbit hole. I regret my life choices already. D- um, dig us out. I don't, I don't think I've, I've posted on it quite yet. Maybe I will by the time we publish this video, but yeah. So the, basically the person kind of said, Hey, what's this all about? And I started digging into it and on the, their key specs tables or on the specs table, not the key specs table on the specs table on Garmin.com for every device. Now, at least every watch that I looked at, there is a security end of life, uh, date listed. Uh, and so that date, if you click on that information or that little like link, it takes you to uh, like a warranty ish kind of page. And in there, like a couple lines say Garmin will be providing security updates, um, for devices for two years from data launch. Um, and so, okay, that's established. But the problem that both this person on Twitter that hit us both up, as well as like a bunch of other people that email me on the side of that same time frame was that the dates didn't match. So like it would show that the uh, Phoenix 7 Pro and the Epix Pro, which came out on uh, May 31st or June 1st, whatever it was of last year, um, their two-year cycle ended uh, like May 17th of 2025. And you're like, that's not two years. That's like bad exchange rates, right? And like, what what <laughs> happened there? <laughs> and then someone else sent me one and that was the Instinct 2. And the Instinct 2 was also short by like 15 days. But when they clicked on the Instinct 2 Solar, they got an extra year or vice versa. Like it was it was completely inverted. It was like, wait, what? Why are these all such a mess? And then I looked at another watch and this is where the rabbit hole started going down. And everyone was different. It was like someone took the date and then like shook a bottle of offsets <laughs> and it was like, the offset for this product shall be 22 days. The offset for this product shall be one year in 14 days. And you're like, what the hell? Um, so I went over to Garber and I'm like, what, what is up with this? I don't, I don't understand. Was this like an accidental release? Did this not mean to go out? Um, is there something I'm missing here as to how, like, is, is this a different two years? Like, is there American two years and a Ray two years and a Des two? I don't really understand this. Um, 
they gave me a very like curt, curt reply back that basically said <laughs> um, um it pretty much said along the lines of like uh this is something we're working on this should be fixed in the next couple of weeks <laughs> and uh, i'm like uh and basically said it should be everything should be two years across the board um okay so okay so setting aside the complete dumpster fire that it is right now, uh, sure. let's assume we get to the fire is put out and it's two years across the board for security hey, updates. Security, yeah. I think that's kind of wimpy, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it, this kind of made some big waves last year when Google announced, right? And I think at their keynote that they were doing, what, up to five years or something like that of security yeah, updates like, or even longer um, yep. for some of their devices. So, but yeah, two years... I think Garmin, again, has been getting better at releasing new features for older watches. And the, the, I've been th- I think they've been doing it pretty darn consistently. But the security update thing, that does seem a bit short. Yeah. Yeah. To me, like, again, we can debate you know, the, the usual Garmin challenge of when they provide feature updates for and how many years. I think they're they're realistically in that two-ish to three-year time frame right now uh, for some of the watches mm-hmm. from release anyways, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the security update is weird because... By and large, Garmin is doing that already, right? Like they are still releasing security updates for the Phoenix 6 series. We see that all the time. And that's well beyond two years for the base Phoenix 6. That's at what? I'm guessing like five or six years now. Maybe oh five gosh, years, yeah, like that's that. been a while now. Uh-huh. Yeah. So like, I don't understand why why they stuck themselves in that pickle of saying, like why they open themselves up to attack when they're already doing it for these watches anyways. Um, yeah. Uh, like just say it's going to be four years or five years and know that, yeah, there's going to be the random flyer, right? Like a, a Vivo Move Gen 1 something or other that has some weird security issue that you're like, man, we're at four years and 11 months. Now we got to fix that. Um, but <laughs> yeah, you're already doing it for the, the major watches anyways. I don't understand why you would create this like potential PR mess of having a two-year security update. And the people have kind of commented saying, you know, this is where I'm putting my credit card information, um, you know, in some way, shape, or form anyways. Uh, we'll setting aside the technical nuances of how that all works, but at the end of the day, you can pay with tap. So if there's a security hole on the watch, you could use their credit cards. It's where you're putting other information these days. So I can see how ECG information from a medical device standpoint, um, again, I think it should be at minimum three, if not closer to five years. I think what's interesting about this too is that you know you look at the security of the watch itself versus the uh, Garmin Connect app and platform, and that's really I think where most of your information is going to live anyway. So it's like I'm I'm primarily concerned, I guess you could say, about the app and the cloud, <laughs> yep. and you know my information there. But uh, but you do bring up a good point about the credit card style information and whether that's going to be susceptible, at, you know, in the future, too. So it'll be interesting to see how this all shakes out. I think they'll probably just leave it at two years and hope that no one notices. But, um, you know, at least to to their credit, though, at least they're putting something there, right? Like, yeah, Mm -hmm. a lot of other companies don't bother to put anything at all out there for that. And they just just, you know, do whatever they do along the way. Totally. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. So uh, definitely appreciate the question uh, from the listeners out there. So, and, you know, hit us up on Twitter, the YouTube comments, or basically any of our social platforms for any other interesting topics that uh, we want to bring up. Uh, Somebody did bring up another question about how do we stay healthy for years on end without injury, um, et cetera, basically being sports tech reviewers. And that was a question that we were going to probably tackle on this podcast, but unfortunately, I think this one is running a little bit long already, so we're probably going to have to save that one for next time. But again, if you have any other interesting topics that you want to uh, bring up, go ahead and hit us up on any of our um, socials. Yeah, we've been consolidating list here on our notepad list of things that uh, I think we'll pull that one and a few others into maybe next week. We'll see. I think... Uh... Depends on what goes on next week and what the definition of next week is exactly. Yep, exactly. All right, cool. So that's going to do it for this episode of the FitFile Podcast. Really appreciate all of you tuning in. Any last words, Ray? Yeah, don't forget you can find us on Spotify, Apple Music, as well as uh, YouTube Music. Uh, so any of those locations, as well as at dcremaker.com slash podcast, where you can find the actual RSS feed there too. So no matter what kind of podcast reader you have or a listening uh, tool thingamajig you have, you should be able to, <laughs> to get this uh, one way or another. All right, great. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.